Disgust is considered to be one of the basic human emotions defined by a strong revulsion and desire to withdraw from an eliciting stimulus or event. Darwin noted this back in 1872. So he was the first person to note that disgust was a basic emotion. Physically, disgust is accompanied by a distinct facial expression involving constriction of the oral and nasal cavities. You know, and that's a really good way to insult someone, you know. All you have to do to really insult someone is make a disgust face at them or it's something they said. They really do not like that. Because basically what you're saying is, you're kind of like a parasite or an infectious disease. <laughs> Evolutionary models of disgust propose that this emotion evolved to help us avoid contaminated or harmful foods or other potential sources of diseases such as sexual contact. In addition to its role in directly helping to expel harmful foods from the body, disgust also forms an important component of the behavioral immune system. The suite of psychological mechanisms that aid in the detection and avoidance of potential contaminants before they can make contact with the body. It means obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, people will touch something that they regard as contaminated and then rush off to wash their hands and wash and wash and wash. Like some of them will wash till they, the soap's gone, they'll have showers till they run out of hot water. Like they just can't stop. And that's part of obsessive compulsive disorder. It looks like it's a disorder of disgust, even though it's classified with the anxiety disorders. Harsher moral judgments can even be induced following the consumption of a bitter drink, as people are often disgusted by bitterness. In addition, the same disgust-related facial expressions are observed in response to unpleasant tastes, disgusting photographs, and receiving unfair treatment in an economic game. So, our sense of justice, that's a weird thing. Our sense of justice seems to be, who would guess that, eh? That it's, that it's, that it's centered in our you know, from a biological perspective in, in the systems that mediate disgust. So, I've seen this, you know, among people who've, who've received an injustice, you know. So, so something's been done to them that's not good. And they're often unable to let it go, partly because they're disgusted with themselves for not responding to it properly. It's like, you know, if someone throws a dart at you, and then it's like you have a moral obligation to respond to that, right? And you can think about it as anger or something like that, but Part of it also seems to be that you're ashamed if you don't respond. And you can see that sort of thing happening in cultures of honor, you know, where if, if purity is violated, you see these in these situations where, you know, a father maybe kills his daughter, which happens reasonably often because she's violated some sort of social norm. Part of the idea is that, well, you know, if you don't respond harshly to something that's associated with disgust, then you bring dishonor on your entire family and maybe on your entire community. So some of you may know I was at McMaster University a couple of weeks ago and there were a bunch of protesters there and I went up to, to meet the protesters because I kind of wanted to see what would happen. There were a bunch of them around the, end, the back of the room and I offered to shake their hands and mostly what I got was disgust faces, you know, and that's not good. That's not good. So here's something to know too. Here's a, here's a good predictor of whether or not you're going to get divorced. You go into the therapist's office and you talk, the two of you talk and you roll your eyes. That'll predict. If, you roll, if you're rolling your eyes at your partner, you're going to divorce them. Why? It's a disgust response, right? It's something like, I'm lifting you up with my eyes and throwing you into the garbage. It's something like that. But eye rolling is a great predictor of the probability of divorce. So, so it's something to keep in mind with regards to your relationships. Like if you're starting to develop some contempt or some disgust, you bloody well better get on that right away because that's a bad road to go down. And so, well, so... Well, so then you have to do whatever you have to do not to go down that road. You know, think of a horror movie. Okay, so what exactly constitutes horror? Well, there's the, um, what's that movie called? The Witches of Blair Witch Project. Have you seen the Blair Witch Project? Okay, the Blair Witch Project is all fear. Nothing ever happens in the movie. It's just this horrible sense that something awful is going to happen at any moment. Pure fear. And so that's a horror movie. But then there's the other kind of horror movies where people get like sawed up with chainsaws. And so then you think, well, those, those both come under the horror rubric. But the one is almost pure fear. And then the other is, what is it exactly? Is it fear and disgust? So it looks like the splatter film, so to speak, capitalized on disgust. And, hor and the, the, the sense of horror is partly fear, but also partly disgust. And so the disgust sensitivity system looks very old evolutionarily, although it looks particularly well-developed in human beings, because it's not that obvious. 
It's not that obvious that animals show disgust the same way human beings do. I mean, think about dogs, right? Jesus, those things, they're, they're like, everything smells good to a dog. You know, and they'll eat virtually anything too. And, but humans aren't like that at all. We're very picky, maybe because we're omnivorous. I don't exactly know. We're very picky. And, you know, there's also specific facial expressions that are associated with disgust. You know, they're like that. And it's partly an expulsion facial expression. You're closing your eyes so you don't have to see it. You're closing your nose so you don't have to smell it. It's like repulsion and re repugnance are associated with disgust sensitivity. So being sensitive to disgust seems to go along with a lot of other things like black and white moral thinking. It's like things are either good or they're not and there's no gray area in between and, and like anorexics are like that to, to a great degree. Like it's black or white. There's no gray at all. And um, they're also very judgmental, people who are orderly. And I think the black and white thinking goes along with the, with the, with the judgment. It's like, well, you're either doing well or you're not. There isn't, there's no mucking about in the middle. And so they're hard on themselves, orderly people, but they're also hard on other people. And one of the things we know, for example, is that if you're conscientious, although it predicts workplace success and that sort of thing, and general well-being, if you're conscientious and you become unemployed, you're in real trouble because, you know, Maybe because you're conservative in your fundamental orientation, you think all those people without jobs, they're just fundamentally useless. And, you know, if they just tried harder, they would get to where they're going, which, of course, has some truth to it, but not completely. So then you fall into that category, and, well, then you're kind of, they say, hoist with your own petard, right? Because now you're among the, the great unwashed, and because you're disgust-sensitive, that's not going to make you very happy. So conscientious people suffer a lot when things happen to them that are bad because they also assume, because they seem to be very fond of willpower, they also assume that, well, with just enough effort and with just enough willpower, you can get yourself out of, out of anything. And, you know, that's sort of true. If you put a lot of effort into something, the probability that you'll do well increases. But that isn't the same as if you try hard enough, you can get out of anything, right? You know, you know what I mean? The grayness there really matters. So... Um, because there's lots of things that hard work isn't going to get you out of. And sometimes persisting and perseverating at something is actually the wrong thing to do rather than the right thing to do. So it's very tricky. So the orderly types are conservative. To make you conservative, you have to be high in orderliness and low in openness. Especially the more creative element of openness, say, rather than the intellect element. So, so that's interesting, too, because, of course, people tend to think that their political preference is established by their rationality. You know, I'm a liberal because being a liberal is the right way to be, and here's a bunch of reasons why that's the right way to be, and, you know, I've thought that through, and that's why I'm a liberal. It's like, turns out that's probably completely wrong, or at least mostly wrong. You have your temperament, and your temperament makes you intrinsically value certain things. And then because you intrinsically value them, the arguments about why those things are good are attractive to you, and then you remember those arguments. And so liberals, for example, are much more concerned with harm and care than conservatives are. And conservatives are more concerned about things like purity. And so, and those are basic, you know, those are basic, you should be concerned about both of those things. So the purity issue, it's like, well, what happens if you're living quarters are filthy and, and your hygiene habits are terrible. The answer to that is your house gets full of parasites, rats and mice and bugs, and you get sick and then you die. And so, and maybe people around you do too. So, you know, the purity issue really matters. You don't want to eat rotten meat. You want to make sure it's stored properly. You don't want to have the rats eat all your grain. So your granaries have to be in really good order and there can't be any holes in them and so on. And so, like, orderliness and food preservation and, and preservation from illnesses and contamination and all those sorts of things, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's really important. You can't, you can't just push that away and say it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant at all. So, but then again, you can make it too relevant, you know. So one of the things you see with the anorexics is that, you know, they're so sensitive to disgust that they can't stand their own bodies. And that's a weird thing, right? Because, like, is a body a good thing or a bad thing? Well, here, here's an example. So here's an experiment. So you have, you give someone a sterilized cup, and you say, well, you know, put some saliva in the cup, and then you let it sit for 10 seconds, and then you say, well, drink that. Right, now a lot of you are going like this, right? And that's disgusting. And now you won't do that, but then you might ask, well, why? Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, it was in your mouth like 10 seconds ago, so like, what's the big problem? Well, people, people won't do it. 
And you can see a heuristic at work there, right? The heuristic is, don't drink saliva. And it's not like moderated by any sort of trivial situational determinants. You're just not going to do it. But I suspect that you do kiss your partner, for example. Right? And then you think, oh, well, that's kind of a weird exception. It's like, oh, well, my partner turns out not to be disgusting. At least that's what you hope. And then, <laughs> and so, you know, there's this, and that, you know, and, and there's also this weird inhibitory process that goes on between sexual attraction and disgust, too. You know, and, and the psychoanalysts, you know, they were, they thought of that as something that was perhaps somewhat pathological. Sexual guilt, sexual shame, disgust, and all that. But as far as I can tell, it's a... It's a, it's a biological moderating factor, and part of the reason for that is, well, you know, just how many sexually transmitted diseases do you actually want to have? Especially given that many of them are, you know, syphilis in the 19th century, man, that was, that was deadly. It was transmissible from generation to generation, it, it acted like every other kind of disease, and there wasn't any cure for it. And then, of course, we had AIDS in the 1980s, we kind of got a handle on that, but it was just bloody luck, you know? And it was very transmissible. And so... Sexual contamination is a big issue, and it always has been for the human race because it turns out that sexual activity is a really good way of transmitting disease. So, you know, the, the borderline between disgust as something that protects you in your life and disgust as something that turns you off of life completely, it's, it's a really tight and, and contradictory set of, like, mutual inhibiting forces. It's a real problem for people. So... Okay, so, so, so what, do you, what do you have? Orderliness. Okay, orderly people are black and white thinkers. They're judgmental. If uh, you talk, if you show orderly people, imagine that you have them, dis you describe to them some kind of crime, like maybe it's living off the uh, fruits of prostitution. So maybe you talk to them about a pimp and, you know, you give them a little story about the pimp and then you say, how long should this pimp be thrown in jail? It's like the orderly people think, you just lock them up and throw away the key, you know, they're... They, they judge moral transgressions very harshly. And so that's part, of the, that's part of the aspect that's judgmental. They're not egalitarian either. They don't think that everybody should have the same amount all the time. They're pretty, they're pretty interested in hierarchy and structure. And, you know, there's some real advantages to hierarchy. Um, it, it, people think that they'd be happier in an egalitarian situation, but the problem with egalitarian situations is people are always arguing. Right, because no one's right in an egalitarian situation. They're just, everybody gets to have their opinion. And it's like, you know, when are we going to stop with all the opinions and do something? And the thing about a hierarchy is, the advantage to a hierarchy is, there are things you are responsible for, but there's also things you're not responsible for. And that's a big advantage. And then you also know who is responsible for those things. So it looks like people are more comfortable in hierarchies than they think, even if they're liberals. So that's kind of interesting, too. So, so this question is about uh, uh, hypercritical thinking. Yep. Now everyone knows that critical thinking is a great thing to develop. You have to be able to, I guess, think about your ideas. So if information is presented to you, you have to decide if it's legitimate or if there's some sort of deceit behind it. <clears throat> but when it's taken to its extreme. Yeah. No matter how great or noble somebody is, you can always find a crack in the armor and try to figure out how they're covering up something that's not great about them, you know? And you might then discredit everything they do as just a, a facade. Okay, so, let, so let me stop you there for a sec, because I want to address two of the issues that you already brought up. So there's, there's the issue of hypercritical thinking, partly in relationship to yourself and partly in relationship to others. So I, I'd like to address the issue with regards to yourself to begin with. So there's this idea that Carl Jung developed. Um, he extracted it, I don't know from where, from some ancient writings that he was familiar with. I believe they were Jewish writings. He said that, classically speaking, traditionally speaking, God was viewed to rule being with two hands, the right hand and the left hand, and the right hand was justice. And that was, you're going to get what's coming to you. But the left hand was mercy. And the idea essentially was that the cosmos could not exist without the proper combination of justice and mercy. You should get what's coming to you. But people are fallible and they make mistakes. And so it's reasonable to apply that to yourself. You know, there's an idea that's been developed by psychologists over the last few decades that people are basically narcissistic and that 
they generally feel that they're better at most things than other people. Um, I don't buy that. I don't think the experimental evidence for that is very strong, and I certainly haven't seen that, for example, in my clinical practice, where I've seen that people are generally far harder on themselves than they are on other people. Um, one example of that, I've written about this in my new book too, is that you know, if you have a pet that's sick and you take it to the vet and you get medication, you're very likely to give the pet the entire course of medication. To go to the pharmacy to get the prescription filled, to give the pet the medication, to follow it through. But if you are the person who has the problem, yeah, you all laugh because you know the story. It's like, a third of you won't even go fill the prescription, and of the remaining two-thirds of you, half won't, won't take it to completion. And you think, well, wh why are people like that? And I think it's because they know themselves, they have contempt for themselves because of their flaws, and then they come to despise themselves. And I think that's a big mistake. That's lack, that's too much justice and not enough mercy. And, you know, Jung wrote about the biblical injunction that you should treat your neighbor as if he were yourself, essentially. But he talked about that as an equation, which was quite interesting. So, because it's often read as something like, you should be nice to people, which is not what it means at all. Because first, nice is a very low-end virtue. But it isn't what it means. What it means is that you should, you should treat your neighbor as if he or she is someone that you wish to encourage and develop but that you should also have exactly the same attitude towards yourself which is sort of in some sense regardless of what your opinion is of yourself critical let's say hypercritical even which is often the case with people who are anxious or who per perhaps who are hyperconscientious you have to put forward to yourself the same sympathy we could say that you would extend to someone else that you cared for. That's the thing, is that you have to come to treat yourself as if you're someone that you care for. And I mean that technically. You know, you detach yourself from yourself and you think, okay, well, if I was going to construct a mode of being that was optimal for this person that I happen to be, what would that look like? And that's sort of independent of whether or not you think you deserve it. It's like, maybe you deserve it, maybe you don't. Innocent until proven guilty, that's a pretty good policy. But you should come to lay out a mode of being for yourself that gives you some credit. You know, and that will also help you in your dealings with other people, but it's often very difficult for people to do that to themselves.